Good to see you, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's DCRI Research Conference. It's a real pleasure today to introduce Dr. Uh, James Cheng, who's a longstanding faculty member here at Duke. He's a professor of medicine, as well as a professor of community and family medicine in informatics. He has a number of leadership roles, including director of the Duke Information Systems for Cardiovascular Care, director Information Technology Solutions for Duke Heart Center, director of Performance Improvement for Duke Heart Center, and chair of the Clinical Competency Committee in Interventional Cardiology. He, his own work focuses on harmonizing the clinical and operational definitions and informatics of cardiovascular clinical data elements across academia, regulatory agencies, the life sciences industry, professional societies, standards organizations, as well as research organizations to capture, uh, communicate, uh, sorry, to improve the capture, communication, interoperability, and analysis of healthcare information. As you all know, this is critical to facilitating the, realize, uh, the realization of uh, having strong information technology uh, underlying structures for improving clinical care and research. Um, Dr. Chang is widely known across uh, the country and serves a number of leadership roles, including uh, as a faculty member of the Medical Device Epidemiology Network Coordinating Center here at the DCRI, the non-regulatory member, sorry, and is a non-regulatory member of the International Medical Dis Device Regulatory Regulators Forum. In addition, he's a chair of the Informatics and Health IT Task Force for the ACC, as well as a member of the ACC NCDR Management Board, the ACC Science and Quality Oversight Committee, ACC AHA Task Force on Clinical Data Standards. And uh, today we'll be presenting on making structured reporting happen in the cardiac cath lab. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chang. Uh, thank you very much, Uptal. That was a very gracious introduction. I wish my mom were here to hear that. Uh, <laughs> um, so, what I'd like to do is take you on a bit of a journey. Uh, the uh, topic that I will be covering over the next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so is making structured reporting happen in the cath lab. And although it's fairly uh, straightforward, it actually has many twists and turns. The journey has been an interesting one. So I, I do want to walk you through what we've accomplished in the Duke cath lab and what we're trying to accomplish really throughout the world regarding structured reporting. Uh, I have no disclosures that are relevant to this uh, presentation. So the objectives of my presentation are listed here. Uh, the first one is to explain to you what structured reporting really is. It isn't a report. It isn't a piece of paper. It isn't a piece of uh, uh, a structure of data. In, in fact, what I will describe to you is it's really a process uh, that uh, results in the produ production of a structured report as a document, but uh, the structured reporting itself really defines or describes a whole process of interaction of the team members that participate in care, et cetera. Um, I'm going to identify a few use cases that are advantaged by structured data and the structured report, uh, but more importantly, spend a bit of time recognizing the barriers to clinician adoption. Uh, structured reporting, I think, uh, or I hope at the end of this, you'll see it's a fairly logical approach to accomplishing uh, a specific task, and that's improving the quality of the data going in. Why, what's uh, taking us so long? Why haven't we been able to accomplish that? And to uh, summarize the roles and responsibilities of the affected groups in accomplishing a best practice structure reporting. So if you dumb it down just a moment and ask me, what did I just say? What I'm trying to do is fix the garbage in part of the garbage in, garbage out. Okay, so as everybody knows, uh, uh, about garbage in, garbage out from Wikipedia. Uh, Wikipedia, the quote is, it refers to the fact that computers will unquestioningly process unintended, even nonsensical input data, and as a consequence, will produce undesired, often nonsensical output. All right, so how do we fix this so that we actually uh, get better data out, which is, I think, uh, everybody right here recognizes the key to improving patient outcomes, uh, delivering better individualized patient care and reducing the overall cost of uh, healthcare delivery. So over the course of my presentation here, what I'd like to review with you is uh, the following points. First, how do we get here? How do we end up where we are? Talk about the need for data and the multiple dimensions of the, that need. Then really delve into what structured reporting is all about, what it is and why we want to do it. and then chat about a little bit of the work that I've done with the American College of Cardiology and its sister societies 
in creating a standard, a professional standard, which I, am, I would like to argue that uh, we can now hold up as a standard for the entire uh, clinical domain, that's the uh, clinicians, the physicians that are participating in the cardiac cath lab procedures. Lots of details that are apropos to chat about to illustrate what structured reporting is all about, and then I'll cl close with a few perspectives. So how do we get here? Well, the story about data is an old one. In the 1850s, Florence Nightingale, who was actually not really a uh, not really known as a nurse per se, but actually was holding a torch as a social reformer and backed up her, uh, her recommendations with statistics. Um, she was really credited as the first one to think about big data. Did you guys know about that? All right, so big data. One of the things about big data is that in order to assimilate big data, you have to be able to visualize it. You have to be able to understand it. And so she came up with the polar area plot. And so for those of you who've used polar area plots before, you probably understand what you're looking at. But basically, a polar area plot allows you to explain multiple dimensions of data in one graphic. So here she's explaining not just why people died, but also when they died in this polar diagram. A little hard to read here, but basically these are the months around the circle here, and then the darker uh, area is the, um, uh, if I remember correctly, it's the reasons that were preventable, death that was preventable. The uh, black was death from, uh, from uh, battle, and then uh, the red was death from infectious disease, all right? So she's the first to come up with polar plots, which explain multiple dimensions, in her case, what the reason was why folks were dying, and then why, uh, excuse me, when they died as well, relative to the months of the year. Uh, Jacques Bertillon is classified with coming up with the first classification of causes of death in 1893. That led to the Bertillon classification, and then the League of Nations got a hold of it and said, let's do something a little bit better than that, and came up with the International Classification of Disease, version 1. U.S. is on version 9 right now. The world is on version 10. Uh, pretty soon we will actually be uh, not just lapped once, by the rest of the world, but twice, because ICD-11 will be um, on board in about a year and a half to two years in the rest of the world, where we are just now starting to bring on, on board ICD-10. Some of the other uh, notable things that have occurred over the years are listed here, uh, but as you think about all of this, all of these efforts here to categorize information, it's all about trying to list things as, if you will, data. In the setting of interventional cardiology, and I'm an interventional cardiologist, for those of you who don't know, um, I would also like to say that we have, already, we have always thought about the importance of collecting information as data. This is Andreas Grunzig in the upper right-hand corner, who is credited as being the father of interventional cardiology. He was the first person to perform a balloon angioplasty in, in the world back in uh, 1977 in Germany. And by 1979, there had been several hundred angioplasties performed in the world, and every one of those is listed here on this blackboard. So uh, it's not something that's novel or unique, this idea of needing to collect information so that you can better understand what happens with patients as time progresses. Uh, this is an interesting picture from the archives of the American College of Cardiology. For those of you who ever went up to the ACC in Bethesda, Maryland, when it was up in Bethesda, not in downtown DC, uh, the first angioplasty registry uh, was initiated back in 1986 and this is the system that they were using. Uh, it's quite a bit different today because basically all the computational power that you see here will fit on my laptop today, but uh, pretty amazing picture from the archives. The point of this is, is that, at least in the interventional cardiology world, we've really been interested in data really from the get-go. So what's happened in the last 20 years, and actually has been 20 years that the winds have been buffeting the collection of data and the uh, desire to do things with data. Uh, what's been happening in the last 20 years relative to interventional cardiology is listed up here. So in the mid-1990s, I would say this is really kind of the first part, uh, first part of the journey towards digitization of what happens in the cath lab. It started off actually with the images. We went from film, 35 millimeter film, 
silver iodide processing, et cetera, over to digital mechanisms for capture that information and then PACS systems, picture, archive, and uh, communication systems so that we could store the information digitally. It's pretty remarkable today. You can walk into the Duke Cath Lab and still get films, studies, not films, not the physical films, but studies dating back into the late 1990s. So if you have a patient who comes back with recurrent disease, as we often see with coronary artery disease, we can go back and retrieve their films. Unfortunately, this journey from where we started, and that's the understanding that we needed to digitize things, to today has been, as I said before, buffeted by a number of different factors. E&M guidelines, e &M guidelines, evaluation and management guidelines were defined back in 1995, revised back in 1997, and really define how we get paid. Now, unfortunately, how we document then impacts how we get paid. So one of the big factors, and I'm going to mention this later on, about uh, the place we've ended up has to do with this e and guidelines, which leads to note bloat, defensive medicine, copy, cut and paste, et cetera, so that we can document more so we get paid more. Very, very bad idea when we look back on it in, in retrospect, but it is what it is and we have to deal with it. Other things that have happened more recently and is in 2009, everybody I think here knows about the HITECH Act, that's the Electronic Health Record Meaningful Use Initiative that has really changed all of the information technology, health information technology infrastructure within healthcare organizations. It's a big reason why Duke is on Epic right now, is because of this single act. And if you think about all of these different impacts, the real question is, even though we've been imagining for a long time, 20, 30, 40 years, that we should be able to do things with this information, the real question today is, where's the data? We have these EHR systems, but I would actually call it a failure of the EHR model. We're not documenting as data. Instead, we're documenting as text. Uh, the adoption of structured reports is actually discouraged. There's no incentive that exists within the EHR meaningful use structure anywhere to actually adopt structured reports. And because we're not structuring our reports, there's no data. So if there's no data, there's no data exchange, and we're back to basically what the DCRI was built on, the randomized clinical trials model of pushing things out on a piece of paper of things that you want to collect and then re-entering that information into a different system. We have not arrived at Nirvana, which I would suggest to you is let's collect it all once and use it for all different purposes so that we don't have to do things repetitively, uh, create uh, duplicate du errors in duplication, transcription, et cetera. All right, interesting uh, article in um, a potty paper journal. Uh, so we have this in our cath lab uh, bathroom. So when you're going to the bathroom, you can read something, get up to date about uh, what's going on in the world of cath lab. Uh, this was uh, a editorial put together by two people in 2013 to talk about kind of where we were today. And there's some interesting perspectives here that I think are very, very relevant. And the first one is, is that cardiovascular information systems, CVIS systems, actually came about before electronic health record systems, and they were to try to produce a better report based upon data. But now, with the EHR meaningful use agenda, they're largely viewed as unwelcome information islands. That these ideas of capturing data through the process of delivering care, at least in the cath lab being a procedure, uh, has been um, somewhat, um, well, has led to a decline in the demand for, if you will, CVIS systems and by implication, uh, structured data. They would still, however, uh, acknowledged that cath lab, uh, uh, Lisa and Richard uh, acknowledged that cath lab workflow integration is paramount. That is, that the best way to do this really would be to try to marry the processes that occur in the cath lab with the data collection thereof. All right, just kind of makes intuitive sense. And that the CVIS model, the cardiovascular information system model, inherently accomplishes data interoperability much more effectively than the electronic health record. So given that, and given all of our interests collectively here, as well as I would say across the uh, world to put uh, us in a better position to collect and use information, uh, where are we today? Well, the rest of the story is that there's still more yet, yet more forces that need to be acknowledged and recognized. One is the remarkable CPU power that has uh, increased over the uh, decades. If you look at, for example, this is uh, dollars on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis for storage, CPU, and bandwidth. It costs a lot less today 
on a per unit basis to do anything from a technology standpoint. So we are in some ways kind of setting ourselves up for the expectation. Why can't we do what we all believe we should be able to do with data today? In fact, um, as you think about it, uh, there are those who said we should be able to do this, but there are still issues that remain. So this is a uh, Institute of Medicine report where they're calling for uh, some fundamentals. The NIH and the N NCHS, the National Center for Health Statistics, to join together on an international level and define data standards and data elements that can then lead to an interoperable data world. So Brian and uh, Terry and a number of us have been spending a fair amount of our careers working on this aspect of it. What other pressures are there? This is from the uh, International Consortium for Health Outcomes Measurement. That's a database of over 50 registries, and they've asked the question uh, whether or not it's time to allow us to take advantage of the data and then do more, uh, improve uh, uh, health outcomes measurement, improve uh, healthcare systems, and result in uh, the uh, improvement in the healthcare outcomes that I mentioned before. Uh, others are getting in on the act, FDA. Um, and Terry's here in the audience. Uh, uh, FDA is really pushing on the unique device identifier as an enabler of medical device surveillance, anticipating that we have all this data flowing through our system. In fact, if you look at the, st uh, the uh, uh, parts of the UDI and the, the device surveillance environment that they're emphasizing, one is to indeed put on a unique device identifier system, put it in place for all implantable devices, and the second one is to grow the national, international device registries beyond where they are today so that we can do better device surveillance. Why should we be waiting for 100,000 individuals to be exposed to a bad pacemaker lead or a bad hip before we realize or recognize that there's a problem with any of those devices? We also are faced with what I call uh, the five V's of big data. Um, there's uh, basic principles here in terms of uh, what those five V's are. Volume, volume, volume is the first one. Uh, my favorite, by the way, is the Yoda bite. Uh, so, uh, so back to Star Wars and Yoda, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but volume, velocity, variety, variability. Somebody, some folks call this veracity or really the quality of the data and value. How do we bring that into the arena today given that there's just an endless variety of data types and data sources. How are we going to manage all this stuff? How do we fix, if you will, the garbage inside of things so that we can then end up with better data output, better analysis, better visualization, better representation so that we can make um, uh, better decisions? So if you think about the output side, it's actually lots of folks want the information. Lots of folks want this piece, these pieces of information so they can make decisions. And oh yes, there are the clinicians there that actually are pushing it all out there. So the rest of my presentation is really to talk about, let's think about the docs. Let's think about the clinical processes that lead to the collection of good information so that we can then get better data out on the outside, uh, on the output side. All right, so what are the essential issues? The first essential issue is that we do need data standards. We do need a common lexicon that is interoperable from one system to another. Without data standards and controlled vocabularies, we are going to be lost. We are really going to be suffering from the garbage in part of the garbage in, garbage out problem. But is that enough? Again, a lot of folks have spent careers developing this, but uh, I would argue that's really not enough. Because you then need to marry that into the clinical documentation processes. All right? So where are we today as physicians, as nurses, as techs, in terms of the practices that we have in the outpatient environment, in the hospital, et cetera. I would suggest to you that we are mired in ancient paradigms. We are mired in ancient paradigms. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're a medical student on your first rotation uh, and you're trying to describe what uh, uh, is uh, happening with an individual, you go and walk in to see the patient, you get a history and physical, and then you're given an A plus if you can write a novella. In fact, if you can write a novel about that patient, you get an A plus plus. The more you write, the better off your grade will be. I call that verbal diarrhea, okay? So where we need to be thinking is how do we change these ancient paradigms? In fact, uh, the problem is it really starts in medical school. 
Another thing that is unfortunately encouraged by our environment is this tendency to do play-by-play. -play. In order to be able to replicate what happened during an encounter, if this case should ever come up in a court of law, all right, that's the big thing that we worry about, that we can be able to kind of regurgitate, back to the diarrhea other side, okay, back to the uh, metaphor here, the occurrences that happen during an encounter. Um, we also have an unfortunate part that uh, the more flowery you write your documentation, the better it makes you look as a doctor. So it's a demonstration of physician prowess, all right, uh, that I'm a great physician. And in fact, uh, there's a fair amount of, if you will, justification of actions. What does this lead to? Well, I would argue with, it, with you that 75 to 80 percent of our notes today are garbage. They are meaningless drivel that is intended solely for one purpose, and that is so that we can get paid more than if we just document sparingly, and also so that we satisfy certain, if you will, regulatory oversight, uh, such as uh, EHR meaningful use, all right? And in fact, another problem with our documentation paradigms is that these are siloed approaches. So the nurses always document just the nursing things. The doctors always document just the doctor things. The techs only document the play-by-play -play in the cath lab, and kind of never the twain shall meet. So how do we change this paradigm? How do we move to a different paradigm that accomplishes multiple things, makes us all more efficient, makes the data better in terms of quality, makes the data better in terms of volume. You have more information, more data that can be then be processed, et cetera. And how do you identify the right spot? Okay, now the right spot is probably not the clinic environment. You don't want to straddle, uh, you don't want to, excuse me, not straddle, you don't want to uh, labor a physician with trying to do documentation by check boxes. We call that death by clicking. In fact, there still is a value for language to articulate the story of why a patient has something. But in a procedure context, in a procedure context where it really doesn't matter how much fastidious care was it used to administer that 10 cc's of lidocaine to the groin, okay? It, you know, really? That it doesn't make any sense. You stuck a needle in there and then you injected this stuff that burned like hell, you know? So that's what we do. Don't talk about the fastidious care. Just say the right femoral axis was the access site and you injected 10 cc's of lido. That's all that's really needed, all right? So what the clinicians really want is the best approach for the task based not upon regulation, based not upon check boxes, but really defined by usability, efficiency, and effectiveness. How easy is it to use the interface? How well does it convey the information that needs to get out there? And then how efficient, how much time, literally, does it take to do uh, the work to, minimally, um, to meet the minimal standards for uh, the documentation? The capturing of information of, as data is something that is embraced by the clinician community. Don't think for a moment that I'm saying that we should kind of run away. In fact, we want to figure out how to do this. We want to capture information as data because we recognize the potential for the use of that data. But only where the data are actually useful, conveying clinical administrative info, risk calculation, risk stratification, predictive modeling, things that are relevant to patient care, things that are meaningful in terms of prediction of what's going to happen, following a medical device, whatever it might be. Uh, and so I would argue for you, uh, argue with you that procedure reporting naturally is a place where structured reporting makes sense uh, because especially for device implants, this is where it starts. If you don't know that a very specific model brand serial number of a device is implanted at a very specific date and time in a specific patient, you, you can't figure out anything else, all right? So you do have to start somewhere, and that's why we picked the cardiac cath lab. So what we decided to do was try to figure out how to do structured reports via a structured reporting process uh, in the cardiac cath lab. We would use data, not words, to mostly populate the report. The data acquisition would become a team enterprise. It would become something that would be done by all members of the team rather than this siloed approach where only the techs are documenting the play-by-play, -play, only the uh, nurses are documenting their portion of the assessment, only the doctors are documenting their parts so that they get paid, all right? Um, there are other efforts going on that I'm participating on, uh, in, but I'm not going to have a chance to chat about just given the uh, interest of time. But I do want to mention that even in the outpatient environment, even in this 
much more analog environment, face-to-face -face environment, where you're trying to describe the patient's story. We are also still working on what I would call a thin layer of data so that you can understand what's going on that, with that patient in a quantitative way and then use that information uh, for uh, follow-up. So even in the outpatient environment where things are inherently non-structured, we're still working on making a semi-structured document, but that uh, will be the subject of a, of a different talk at a different time. All right, so what is structured reporting? I've talked about it a number of times. I've tried to set you up to think about it's not the piece of paper, it's not the PDF, it's not the XML file, but instead, what structured reporting is, at least in my mind, is it's data management that's integrated into the workflow. What does that mean? What that means is that those who are handling the data as it occurs are the ones who are responsible for entering that data, for capturing that data in the information system and assuring the quality of that data. Okay? Our current paradigm is for, and this isn't at Duke, this is other places, but our current paradigm is for the doctor to, after the procedure is over, say, man, was that a 2-0 balloon that I put in there? Was that a 2-5 stent? I think that's what it was. And he picks up a dictaphone and says, uh, with fastidious care, I in, in inserted a uh, 2.5 by, was that 18 millimeter or 20 millimeter? Uh, I think it was 18 millimeter. So, you know, sometimes they have a little crib sheet that reminds them what devices they use, and sometimes they don't. But oftentimes this dictation is done hours, days after the procedure when they can get around to it. So what do you do? Because you need to communicate with the healthcare team. You do need to put a short note in. So you have this scribbled note in there. It says, successful PCA of, or PCI of the proximal LED implanted DES, drug eluding stent. There's no data in there. In fact, all, it is a good form of communication, but it isn't a complete set of data. And the data that could be acquired is then relegated to a dictation sometime down the road where all of that is um, subject, to, uh, subject to recall error, et cetera. So why not do it all at the time when it's being done? The tech is opening the package for you, and there's a barcode on there that can get scanned and put the data into the information system, and then that piece of data can populate your note, and you don't need to remember what it was that you put in, because it's, it's there, all right? So let's use the people that are um, handling the information to capture that information and then have the computer recompile it at a later time in a way that actually makes sense as you try to read it as a human being. Uh, multiple authors are key to contributing to the procedure report context, okay? Not just the doctor picking up a dictaphone and doing the whole thing. The tech has a role, the nurse has a role, even the secretary who signed the patient into the hospital, signed the patient into the uh, outpatient uh, cath lab area, wherever the admission point is important as well because there's a date of admission, date of discharge. Uh, they typically record who the referring physician is. Very, very important to get that referring physician information. Why not have that data flow all the way through the system? It reduces physician time to procedure report completion. I'll give you some metrics at the very end as to what we were able to accomplish. It improves the clinical care, uh, cl clinical communication with the care team. Why? The doctor isn't focused on this drivel that he needs to dictate, but instead can think about what did you see during the procedure and what does it mean? What are you going to do with that patient? Uh, what are the recommendations going to be? And it really follows this collect once, use many times uh, paradigm. So what is needed for this? There's four major components. You need to have standardized vocabulary and data. Uh, uh, data elements. I mentioned that before. I'm not going to belabor the point uh, again. You need best practice workflows. This is industrial engineering at its best. I have a nephew who's an industrial engineer. I didn't know anything about industrial engineering until we started talking. And I said, you're doing what I need to be able to do too. Now I understand why this is so important. So he went through the, it was really cool because he explain to me how the tools are, it's, it's not really complicated stuff, it's just visual, but you have to take step by step and figure out what you're doing. All right, so best practice workflows that then can be replicated to other places beyond the initial experience. We also have to set professional expectations of our cardiovascular clinicians, not just the physicians who are doing the procedures, but actually I would argue the entire healthcare community. Drop the verbal diarrhea, okay? Get away from these the uh, ancient paradigms of documentations and think about converting to a structured data model and then 
in order to enable that, you have to work with the IT system uh, vendors. So let's take a look, a look a little bit of, at each one of these aspects. The first one is, is that it does take a village to create even the data and interoperability standards. I've been working uh, at the level of the ACC for now uh, a number of years, along with a number of folks here in this room um, uh, that uh, uh, have contributed to the development of standardized vocabularies. And you might say, well, isn't SNOMED doing this? SNOMED is the uh, systemized nomenclature of medicine. Uh, or doesn't UMLS do this, you the Unified Medical Language System, or doesn't ICD do this? The answer is no. These are all concepts that are largely for administrative and billing purposes. Remember, the whole E&M structure is created so we can bill, all right? Not so that we can document what's going on. What we need is clinical documentation. At the level of cardiovascular disease, you might say, oh, that's a daunting task. We've already done it. it turns out that all you need are about 100 terms to define 95% of what happens in cardiovascular medicine. Now, you're going to miss still a lot of stuff, okay? Now, because you're not going to handle, like, for example, subacute uh, bacterial endocarditis, some weird stuff. But for the most, for the biggest corpus of stuff that needs to be done in cardiovascular medicine, you can handle it all with 100 terms. We've proven it, okay? We can, uh, we can uh, fulfill the performance measures that have been published by the ACC the guidelines, documents, et cetera, with these 100 data elements. And there's a myriad of data elements, uh, 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 quality measures, I should say, that are, are out there already. But we can actually answer all of them using 100 different concepts. If you want to do a little bit more than that, the National Cardiovascular Research Institute, which, again, many of us here participated in, with, uh, uh, led by uh, Bob Harrington and um, uh, Eric Peterson, uh, have defined an additional 200 plus terms that are relevant to cardiovascular research. So you have to go a little farther than that uh, in order to do that, uh, in order to capture information related to research. But it's still not thousands and thousands of terms. Uh, we have a cardiovascular endpoints terminology that Karen Hicks and myself worked on from FDA to try to define once and for all what an endpoint is, regardless if it's a cardiovascular trial or a diabetes trial or an observational study of uh, yet a different agent. And then we get to the uh, cardiac cath structure reporting document. So looking at the first three, this is uh, just one of them. Again, this is the National Cardiovascular Research Institute, uh, excuse me, National Cardiovascular Research Infrastructure Project that uh, uh, Skip Anderson and myself and a number of us uh, here uh, have led. So I would refer you to these if you're really interested um, about data standards and interoperability. More relevant to the talk here is a work that uh, is uh, literally the work of a cast of thousands. So we involved uh, 15 different societies, and you can read them here in the fine print. There is the ACC, the Society of Cardiovascular Angiography Interventions, American Heart Association, standards developed organizations including HL7, uh, DICOM, international organizations including the Cardi Canadian Cardiovascular Society, the, um, uh, the uh, South American Cardiovascular Society, even the Asia Pacific Cardiovascular Society got involved trying to come up with, okay, what is structured reporting and what are we going to do about it? This is structured reporting, okay? This is, no, this is why I didn't show you this guy at first, because then you'd fall asleep just right away. But this is the industrial engineering part of this, to understand all the phases of care across cardiac catheterization and everything that happens in the cath lab. Because then this informs this diagram, which you can now start to read a little bit better, which is to break apart all of the different aspects of the uh, phases of care across the, if you will, the x-axis against what sources of information exist, what information needs to be captured as data, digital data, not just text type of analog stuff, but what needs to be captured as data, who the actors are, who is going to be doing it. Is it a nurse? Is it a doctor? Is it a secretary, et cetera? What information system is going to be used in each one of these? What form is it a keyboard? Is it a tablet? Uh, is it something that you dictate into? Voice recognition, et cetera. And then what are you trying to capture as data in that phase of care? And so suffice it to say, this is fairly, I would say, typical of medical processes where it isn't just a single transaction, but it's a series of events that lead to something that one consider as a global transaction, in this particular case, a cardiac cath procedure, where you have to divide each one of these into its various aspects in order to identify what the best practice should be in each sector, 
Okay? So just to break it apart a little bit more for you, if you're thinking about before the procedure even starts, you have a number of folks who interact with the patient. You have the physician who orders the procedure. He's got a reason, he or she's got a reason for thinking, I want to have this patient undergo cardiac catheterization. You have a pre-procedure evaluation by the person who's going to be performing the procedure, not necessarily the person who orders it. In fact, most of the time, it usually isn't. So there's an assessment that needs to be made. Well, what's that physician asking? They're typically asking, what kind of discomfort are you having? What type of procedures have you had before? What tests have you had before? Can you qualify the, uh, uh, the description of your chest pain, et cetera? Um, they also will deal with the scheduling logistics, the clinic, uh, the uh, procedure indications from an administrative standpoint, like ICD-9, et cetera. And essentially, out of all of that, there is some documentation that has to occur in order to schedule the patient, et cetera. But you can take the bits and pieces of it that result in the structured history and physical and put those into the computer. Why is that relevant? Well, that allows you to capture data for risk modeling, for quality measurement, for performance improvement, and for support for remission. So collect it once by the person or persons who are seeing or interacting with that patient at that phase, put it into the computer, and anticipate that it's going to be used by anybody who needs it downstream using data standards that have been established for the collection of those key pieces of information. What does this look like? This looks like this for the cardiac cath lab. A little bit detailed here, but uh, there's only a couple things I want to point out here. The first one is that since we see patients over and over again, we actually have this button called import data from previous history. Okay? You say, well, that's cut and paste, isn't it? Well, it's kind of. I'm going to say that it's kind of cut and paste, but if you've had hypertension once, you have it for life. If you have diabetes, you have it for life. Okay? So don't do things repetitively that don't need to be um, uh, what your job now is to, if you will, verify the information. What you don't see in this is that if you click on the import data from history, and I can't do this dynamically, but you're only given certain pieces of it. You're only given those pieces where it makes sense that repeating it, uh, repeating those questions, uh, really is the, what you should be doing is validating or verifying the quality of that information rather than trying to go get it again and again and again, which is kind of how we do things in medical care. We just, you know, how many times you've been to the doctor? They always ask you the same questions over and over and over again, right? So we're trying to break that paradigm. Just ask the questions that are relevant, like what's your current state of angina? You don't get that pre-filled because that's not relevant, uh, uh, that's not uh, uh, appropriate, okay? So uh, that's uh, some of the things that you see here. Now the rest of the story is, this is it for the history and physical. This is all the data that's required of our clinicians. This takes about, if you walk through this a few times, it takes about a minute, maybe a minute and a quarter to fill this in, all right? That's the pre-procedure stuff. During the procedure itself, who's doing the work? Again, you need to identify who's doing the work. In this particular case, the uh, cardiovascular technologist and or the nurse. Different folks actually are contributing different pieces of information. So those pieces of information have to uh, come together. What's done is to create a play-by-play, -play, the procedure log. This actually is somewhat relevant because once in a while you actually have to go back and figure out how you got to where you were. So they do create the play-by-play -play with the procedure data. The information that's captured as data include the hemodynamics, blood pressure, pulse, that type of thing, the medications that are administered, the procedures performed, the devices that are used and planted, basically everything. Everything that forms the content of the procedure report is already being documented by the staff. It's already being documented by the staff. So you might say, what's he talking about? Why do the doctors then go and document everything else again? Remember, it's because we're wedded to ancient paradigms. We need to break those paradigms and the only way to do that is to say, okay, this is what we're going to do, this is the standard that we're going to create, and this is how we're going to actually do this, okay? And then finally, when it comes time for the physician to sit down, the attending physician to sit down and generate the report, it actually becomes an easy job. It literally takes our docs about two and a half minutes to generate a final procedure report with four to eight pages worth of data on it. Why? Because they're not the ones who are doing all the data collection. 
it's all the staff, it's the pre-procedure stuff, and oh yeah, by the way, they have to do a little interpretation, like read that's a 90% stenosis, or validate and verify other pieces of information, but essentially they're being asked to assure that the data that's there is correct, that the data is high quality, that the data has been captured correctly, et cetera, and then to add their assessment, impressions, and recommendations. Okay, so what does this look like? We have three different parts to the procedure report then. There's what we call the front page. So in the old days, the CATH report basically was just one long string of information that came out, and it was kind of chronological, some summary data, et cetera. We said, no, let's throw that model away. Let's just create a front page where if you are a clinical person, that's all you need to look at, okay? That's all you need to understand what happened to that patient what procedures were performed, what access site was uh, found, what the diagnostic findings were, how much coronary disease they had, which places they had a stent put in, and if there were any complications and the recommendations. Still a fair amount of information, but that's all you really need. There is some pieces of data that uh, need to get put in, um, and some of those pieces of data actually, like I said, are from are entered by the staff. So via the hemocystin, they, they are entering in the right heart cath information. They're even entering in the interventions. Remember, they're the ones who are scanning in the equipment that's used. All they have to do, it does take a little training, but all they have to do is ask, them, so where's the lesion and what the percent stenosis is in order to generate a statement like 90% proximal LED and then you have the device integrity, that's the type of stent, 3.0 millimeter by 20 millimeter bare metal. All that stuff is, if you will, in the computer much, much easier than having the doc try to remember all that stuff, go back and, and, and look at the, uh, um, uh, the study and then try to match it all later after the fact. There is some data that gets input via a tree. That's page two. Why a tree? Picture is worth a thousand words, okay? We also are doing it this way because we're actually asking the fellows to put the data in the tree because we find that's the best way for us to teach them anatomy. If they have to represent the anatomy on a tree, that means they have to know where all the branches are, where all the blockages are, et cetera. All right, so uh, page two is a coronary tree. And then page three is all the rest of the useless drivel that folks actually need so that we can bill, so that we can reorder equipment, et cetera, et cetera, so we can supply data to the registries. It's all there. It isn't that the data has gone away. It's just in a place where if you're not clinically oriented, if you're not a clinician trying to take care of the patient, you don't need to go look at it. You can go look at it if you want to, if there's some specific piece of information that is missing from the front page. But the concept is, let's make this as usable, effective, and efficient for the clinical community, not just the physician, as possible, okay? All right. In order to do this, the vendor community, folks that build IT systems, also have responsibilities. That's been an interesting part of the journey as well. I've been dealing with GE and Philips and AGFA, et cetera, et cetera, trying to convince them, now that we have this health policy statement out there in published form, that they need to step up to the plate and make all this stuff happen. We work with a company called Lumetics to make it happen. Uh, and again, I'll give you some quick metrics at the very end here to explain to you uh, how successful we were. But what we're trying to do is get this message out to everybody else. That uh, first, that we want them to embrace this concept of best practice. Why is this concept important? Well, if you have an IT vendor who comes in to your institution, what's the first thing they ask you? Do you know? They ask you, what would you like us to do? Okay, so they are trying to be accommodating, you know, Henry Ford, the customer's always right, that kind of thing. The customer is wrong here. The doctors don't have a clue what they need to do to make this all work well and all this work right, okay? And that's part of the reason why we need to recruit the vendor space because we need to say to them, you need to have enough gumption to walk into a place and say, we've got the best solution for you and this is supported by ACC, AHA, et cetera, in terms of a health policy statement, professionalism statement, and we're going to enable your environment. It's a different discussion. I can tell you the vendors are very uncomfortable with that. They don't like that idea of them walking in sounding, if you will, almost arrogant. So I said, no, no, it's not arrogance. It's you need to be thinking of yourselves as helping folks achieve the maximal, uh, their maximal capabilities. That's what this really is all about, okay? They also need to uh, accomplish 
maximally usable interfaces. Some of the interfaces that we've seen from the uh, IT vendors are just terrible, all right? So you have to keep, you know, death by clicking, et cetera, et cetera. So we're working on usability aspects. Uh, input devices, uh, one of the vendors says, we are not going to touch tablets. And I said to them, if you're not going to touch tablets, you might as well get out of here because you're not going to get this all done very efficiently and very effectively. Our fellows, one of them is actually using a tablet right now. So when he goes and sees a patient, he just clicks on it and is, is walking over to the next patient. All the documentation is already done. All right? But it's enabled by mobility. It's enabled by mobility. Uh, graphics are really important. We're still struggling with trying to figure out how to really do graphics. Suffice it to say, that's a talk. Uh, at a different time. And then uh, the data management part of it is that everybody has to agree to use controlled vocabularies. Let's all talk the same language, regardless of what the vendor is. The outputs, we did create a structured report prototype against which folks can test to see if their, um, uh, their, per their product actually lives up to this concept of structured reporting. And then from an interoperability standpoint, there's a group called Integrating the Healthcare Environment, which has been uh, focal, uh, focally responsible for making sure that the interoperability part of this uh, all works. Okay, so what did we accomplish? So I put this together from a standpoint of what the problems were to try to illustrate for you why the structured reporting uh, paradigm I think actually works. So the first problem is that we had really inaccurate data. It wasn't bad data, but it was pretty inaccurate. I, I like to tell a story. So at the, in the disk system we've had this computer subroutine running now since I started that actually looks to check to see what your history and physical is relative to the history and physical that you wrote on other patients. Kind of a unique, uh, uh, you know, just trying to detect cheating. And we've actually detected one fellow who put in the same history and physical on a series of is somewhere around 40 or 50 patients before the system triggered. And we had to bring him into the, you know, into the shed and Make sure that he understood that that wasn't the right thing to be doing, okay? So um, the problem really is that if you're trying to do something quickly and you don't have a form factor, you have to write it down on a piece of paper or you have to remember it from memory, et cetera. If you have to do this at a different time, you have to do the documentation at a different time, you're going to lose some of the information. Some of it gets, if you will, lost in translation. So we did have a problem with inaccurate data, inaccurate reporting. The... Um, Distribution of the responsibility to those acquiring the data uh, when they are very close to that data is a remarkable paradigm shift. All right, as, as simple as that sounds, if you can make sure that you're collecting the data at the time you have the access to that information, you automatically improve the quality. We also eliminated double documentation. I told you before about writing a preliminary note. The preliminary note is gone. We don't need a preliminary note anymore because the final report is done before the patient leaves the procedure room. Uh, we are now requiring the attending physician, not the fellow, to author the primary report. The only way, though, that this could work is that if it only took them a couple of minutes to do it. If it was going to take them 15 to 20 minutes to create a final report, like it did in our old system, in the old disk system, it was a non-starter. We couldn't get the attendings to do that and do it well and do it reliably. And in fact, as you can see here at the very bottom, the long delay to final report, it used to be four, four and a half, almost five days between the time that a patient left the lab and a final report was generated. On average, on average, okay, if you get my drift. Now we have a different problem. The report is finished before the end of the procedure and that's really messed up EPIC because EPIC can't accept a procedure report, a final procedure report until the patient physically leaves the cath lab room. And so we've actually had to put a little bit of a, a, a subroutine in there to check to see if the patient's left the room before it will then send the message over to EPIC with the final procedure report. So we'll let the computers figure that one out. But suffice it to say that was a uh, problem that uh, now I would say we've replaced with a good problem. Fellow dissatisfaction. Fellow dissatisfaction, we do pay attention to our house staff, okay? This, the old documentation system was the uh, most um, it was the strongest dissatisfier of all the experiences that they had in the cath lab. They loved doing heart casts. Oh, they loved, you know, sticking femoral arteries or uh, squirting coronaries, et cetera, blowing up balloons. But doing the paperwork, boy, uh, there's them's fighting words. So at any rate, by changing this paradigm, what we are now focusing on is having them learn from the documentation experience. So we 
use them maximally effectively. We don't have them do every patient. Uh, in fact, our nurse uh, practitioners also do some of the pre-procedure documentation as well. Uh, but we're actually having them focus on, tell me about the patient, all right? You need to understand the patient before we bring the patient into the room. You need to document about that patient before we bring the patient into the room so that when they get to the room, we have the information that we need to make the right decisions, uh, et cetera. And I, I mentioned already the coronary tree because that's really an effective teaching tool to teach anatomy as well. Okay, so the world is changing. Um, this is where we were. This is uh, on the left-hand side, I would argue, our ancient paradigms-based approach. It was modality or lab-centric for documentation. That means just focused only on one individual type of test, cath lab, echo, EP, et cetera. Where we're going is to have ubiquitous information, especially the images, but also the data. We were in a paper world. We were using locked-in data. We, all this stuff was local. Uh, where we're going is overlapping interoperable data out there on the cloud. Uh, the one thing that uh, I would bring to everybody's attention here, since we were all the DCRI, is where we were is the clinical trials model. Paper is king. Process, if you will, is king. Where I think we need to go to is informatics, the informatics model, where data is king. And making sure that you have high quality data becomes the paradigm, rather than focusing on all, if you will, the processes related to movement of that data. So, Again, I mentioned before that we created a lot of artifacts to accomplish this. Anybody who's interested can find all this stuff at uh, acc.org. Uh, and with that, I will stop and be happy to answer any questions. So thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks so much. A remarkable body of work that's really paved the way for some wonderful um, uh, foundations here at Duke and, as you mentioned, spreading across the world. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, so the the mentions of all the the team's ability to enter the data. It doesn't have to be the doctor doing it. That's yeah. great, and it reflects uh, the AHR 2020 report that came out of AMIA recently. Um, but when I was in grad school and we were taking the courses discussing these challenges, the thing they drilled into our heads was doctors don't like this, and they fear change, and they don't like to change their workflows. And some of what you said was you have to build the workflow around what they're doing. We also made reference to there is some requirement to change. So is there resistance from especially the older docs? Like, do we just have to wait for them to retire until we can really make this all work? Or what's your sense of that? Yeah, so this is disruptive change. This is changing things that you learn in medical school. This is changing the paradigm of documentation. This is changing even the form of documentation. Yeah. Uh, and it creates a discomfort when uh, faced with those transformations, those transitions. Uh, having said that, it really doesn't take a lot of convincing of a physician uh, when you can demonstrate that they can generate a more complete, a better report, that it's going to get them more money because they are doing a better job of documentation. Not they, it's the royal they, it's everybody is doing a better job of documentation in half the time. Uh, the time part of it is probably the biggest carrot of all of this. Uh, you can beat on doctors with sticks all you want, and if they are set in their ways and they want to do things a certain way, they're going it's, to, it's almost a, a fruitless endeavor to try to. But once you tell them, oh, we're going to cut in half or more the amount of time it takes you to do this, and it paid faster, and we're going to have fewer. Uh, 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 turndowns for reimbursement because of delays in uh, reporting, et cetera, uh, the light bulb goes off and they said, okay, I'm, on, I'm in, and uh, it actually works. So uh, we've done it here. Uh, there are a number of institutions across the United States that have already taken this plunge that um, it's interesting to compare notes because we have a small working group at the ACC of shared experiences, and it is uh, not something that's bounded by age. Uh, the uh, uh, reality is, is everybody's using electronic health records now. So whether you're old, young, et cetera, gray-haired or, 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 or bald or, or just out of medical school, you're still now forced to use computers. So we're not seeing that as a point of resistance yeah. any longer. Come to think of it, the screenshot you showed in the report, was that part of Epic or is this somehow integrated with Epic but not part of it per se? Yeah, so here's a little bit of dirty laundry. Uh, Epic actually doesn't really have a good information model for collecting and reusing data. So <laughs> that's, that's a problem. <laughs> that's a little bit of a problem. So we did all this in
It's all in a different environment called Lumetics. Uh, we're finding that most institutions, when they face that same question, they are opting for a cardiovascular information system. Well, like let Lumetics. me guess, does it then go into Epic as a PDF? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so uh, we have another project going on right now, which would be a topic of yet a different research conference as to how to move data from the modalities over into EPIC as data so that it can be reused. Yeah. Uh, we're starting off with ejection fraction because there's lots of folks that need access to ejection fraction. Um, and um, timeline on that is probably three to six months from now we'll have ejection fraction available as what's called a lab panel, which means that you can actually plot the data over time and, and look at it. Uh, uh, over a temporal um, sequence. Uh, but all of that stuff takes work. Uh, we are going to be the second place in the world that's done this. Okay, so you have to have a little bit of vision and a lot of cajoling, uh, a lot of uh, uh, arm twisting uh, to, to get these types of things done. Thanks. Yeah. So I think one advantage um, that people here might see is that you can pre-populate some of this information into clinical registries or potentially clinical trials, and I mentioned that briefly. What's the uh, dirty laundry there? Are people behind the scenes that are looking at the PDF and then moving that data into the NCDR forms, for example, or is there some crosstalk between the systems? Yeah, so part of the reason why we went with, with Lumetics is that they have uh, an information model, basically the data structures there that already take the data once you put it in and push it over to the NCDR directly. So there's no transcription, there's no transformation of that information onto a piece of paper. So there really isn't any dirty laundry other than um, the, the uh, ACC has a peculiar way of validating that you are a certified vendor for uh, participating in the registries. And so let me explain what I mean by that for a moment. Um, in order to get the checkbox that you're a certified vendor to, that participates in NCDR, you actually have to create forms you have to replicate the paper forms in your system, uh, in, your, in, this particular case, in, in this particular case, the Lumetic system. So in their product called Apollo Advance, they have the forms. And if you want, you can forms in Apollo Advance. As you know from being in the cath lab, we don't use Apollo Advance. We use Apollo's LX system. Apollo LX is a front end that is a development environment that lets us do anything we want to, and then we have to write if you will, the macros that translate from the screenshot that I showed you and populate the uh, data elements in the Apollo Advance product. So there is a little bit of overhead there. Um, Lumetics has actually helped us because they wrote a fair number of these and then showed us how to do the rest of it. And then we're going to turn around and actually, um, I wouldn't say sell it, but uh, participate with Lumetics to get our approach built into Lumetics for distribution to the rest of the Lumetics environment. Lumetics is in about 600 or 700 cath labs in the United States. So um, it's work, but I wouldn't call it dirty laundry. Yeah. It's using computers and computer scientists at their best, and that's figuring out how to make, li make our lives better and make things happen automatically. Yeah. Great. So, so somebody doesn't have the pleasure of working on cath patient setting, uh, we've struggled a lot with getting access to data that's useful and actionable for improving mm -hmm. clinical care. What do you see as the best ways for us to advance that locally, uh, you know, moving out of these sort of more defined contexts to general care, routine care, where the, the list of conditions and variables right. is exponential? Yeah, so let me give you the Pinnacle example here. So Pinnacle is another one of the registries that's run by the ACC, and it's focused on coronary artery disease, heart failure, ventilation, hypertension, lipid management, and a couple other disease states. And it turns out, in, at least in cardiology, in order to manage patients appropriately with, for example, AFib, there's only about three to five data elements that you need at any given encounter to fill the risk models to understand whether or not you're administering proper therapy, et cetera. I should say that there's only about three to five data elements that require physician assessment in order to um, collect the information. So like, for example, in atrial fibrillation, one of the big things is, are you administering the patient an anticoagulant? Well, you don't want to ask the, pay the physician, are you administering an anticoagulant? That's ridiculous. It's a med list. So there's lots of data there that you can then transform 
into yes or no answers that get, if you will, auto-populated. So the only things you really need to ask the patient are, you know, what's your level of heart failure, and then make a, an assessment of the New York Heart Association class of heart failure. So that's uh, typically uh, what is being done now is to create what I described as the thin layer of data that's relevant to risk modeling, prediction, outcomes assessment, et cetera. The bigger thing is, you know, what do you do about outcomes, like a hard endpoint type of things. I wouldn't build that into each one of the assessment tools. This is something that at the enterprise level really needs to be done. So uh, it really doesn't matter if you've got a, a pacemaker put in or if you're on renal, fit, or if you're renal dialysis or you had a stent put in. If you die, you're dead, okay? So that still is an endpoint. And so all of those things should feed into that. And then um, uh, so what we're trying to do is uh, work with the EPIC team to come up with a way to categorize major endpoints, major cardiovascular endpoints that can then be brought back universally and applied against any uh, evaluation, uh, drug device, uh, therapeutic uh, strategy, whatever it might be. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much.